see an Advocate shirt, which means you guys are in the right place at the right time. I would like to bring up the great Donny Cates.
you're awful confident this is gonna work, but I guess keep going. Um, and, and so, it's, and it's never changed. So like now, it's just this ongoing joke that if we're at the retreat and I, I, I have to walk people through what my Venom run is, CB will always go like, all right, so uh, on the agenda, it looks like we have Venom next, so uh, let's all go get lunch first. Um, and then we'll hear the plan again, because I, <laughs> you guys fucking ask. So yeah, it's always been planned. It's always, it's always very intricate. It was always uh, built-in events, built-in like where the book gets insular and then it kind of expands back out and stuff. And the sales of this must have been super reassuring to be like, oh, I can do my five-year yeah. plan. Yeah, like the first, I think um, the sales charts for the past decade came out and two of the top selling books of the decade were my Venom run. Dude. So uh, nowadays people get annoyed at me writing down my plan. I'm like, you like money though, right? So <laughs> you're all going to sit down and shut up and let me tell my plan. <laughs> On the flip side, you got to see Wall writing your baby. Like Venom's your guy. You got to see an adaptation. In 2018, yeah. we got Tom Hardy yeah. playing an insane Eddie Brock, which That's I personally funny. really dug and it made $851 million. Right, yeah, yeah. What was your experience being the writer of a Venom watching someone else handle your baby? It's so odd. And, like there's these, there's, there's, there's been these moments in my career where like, um, I was the writer of Thanos when Infinity War came out. I was. The, I, I remember there was like a four month period in my life where I, when I, people would ask what I did, and I would say I'm the writer of Thanos. They would say I don't know who that is. That shit does, doesn't happen anymore at all. Like I tell people that I wrote Thanos, and, and it's weird. Like I'm like weirdly synonymous with Thanos now. I only ever wrote six issues, and like I mean, I wish you guys knew what my actual Thanos plans were because. Yeah, uh, uh, so dope. Um, but yeah, so I've had these moments like when I was, when, when Infinity War came out, I was both the writer of Thanos and Doctor Strange. And there's that moment where they square off just like, just the two of them. And it's actually a funny story. So I was actually, I was in Calgary uh, at a show when Infinity War came out. And um, we had bought an extra ticket. It was like me and a bunch of, it was like me and like, Dan Slott, C. Orlando, and a bunch of like writers from Marvel. And we had bought an extra ticket and we, and, we, and we auctioned it off for charity so a fan could come, right? And the fan was luckily really cool. <laughs> it was like, as soon as we did it, I was like, oh, that's really nice. I was like, oh, but what if they suck? <laughs> like, what if they're like a really, what if they're a really annoying dick? Um, but we went to this movie theater and um, the theater was opening night for Infinity War. And then, so every, every theater was playing, like every screen was playing, so every nerd in the world was, was there. And so of course I have like a hoodie on and like a baseball <laughs> cap going in there, and we go up to the front uh, to like buy some popcorn, and uh, you know, I'm wearing like a, as I normally am, like some kind of marble, whatever the fuck, you know, and the guy asked me if I want the popcorn. And he says, like, hey, you really excited about the film? Like, yeah, man, yeah, 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 yeah. And, like, the popcorn tins that they had all had different characters on it, right? And he was like, which character is your favorite? And I was like, I, I get that, Thanos one. <laughs> and then the fan behind me goes, he writes Thanos. And he writes Avengers. And he writes this. And it was like going into, like, a fucking Old West saloon. Like, all these nerds just stopped and, like, stared at us. And I was like... Well, that's the end of my enjoyment of this film. So, like, I'm sitting there on when, like, Thanos and Doctor Strange are fighting each other. Everyone in the theater knows who I am now. And so, like, everyone is, like, turning it, like, turning it around, looking at me and be like, bro, bro, bro. I'm like, yeah, dude, I know. I, I think it's tight, too. Shut up. This, this is awesome. And then, like, at the very end of it, two things. At the, at the end of it, you know, Infinity War ends crazy, right? Like, Thanos wins, which is the name of my book at the time, right? <laughs> and so, um, uh, it, it, you know, it cuts to that shot where he's just like, he sits in and rests and it just like goes to black. And, you know, I stood up in the theater cheering. I was like, yeah, that's my man, that's what's up! And then I looked around, dead silence. And they're all staring at me. And I was with Jim Zub, and Jim Zub grabbed my jacket and pulled me down and he goes, no one else was rooting for Thanos. And I was like, right. Like, everyone in this room is heartbroken, and I'm like, yeah, this is what's up! You know? um, so 
yeah, it needs a trip, you know. Um, I got, I was invited to the premiere of Venom by Sony. My Sony's been really cool uh, to me about it, and uh, I ended up not going because Ryan Segman and I actually went to uh, Summit in Marvel to plan Absolute Carnage. Um, and weirdly enough, just this week, um, I've been texting with Tom Hardy a lot. That's really weird. Uh, like he like DM'd me on Instagram to tell me that he really liked Absolute Carnage. And I was like, do you like me enough to put me in your movie? No? <laughs> uh, so like, I want to be real clear for anybody who's like a reporter or plans to be one in the future. I have no affiliation with the, with the film. I, 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 have, I am not working for Sony. I work for the mouse devoutly for anyone who's listening. Um, uh, but I do know everything that happens in Venom 2 and it's going to be fucking awesome. You guys are really going to come and like it. To put in context, I've known Donnie and Megan since before Thanos and he was a yeah. die hard. Like he, would, he came into the show and they are dressed as Bill and Ted, by the way. It was exceptional. Yeah. But they came in and they were like, I really hope Thanos wins at the end. And admittedly, the moment the credits rolled, I was like, because I knew you had your moment, like your comic came to life. I was writing a book called Thanos Wins, and then my, my man just went and did it. He just went and won, dude. I was I was legit bummed out when he lost. And, and then you yeah. came back and got to do Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he got his he got his he got his dome cut off, and I was like, oh. And then he came back and he like nuked Avengers Tower, and I was like, that's what's up. That's my dude. That's all right. Then he lost again. Jim okay. Sterling, also a friend of the show, has the same feelings towards really? it. Oh, it, him talking about Thanos is like seeing someone look at their child proudly. Oh, I completely guns. understand it. Can I tell you something crazy about Jim, Jim Sterling and I? Jim, um, when I was writing Thanos and, and, and Jim uh, and I uh, had spoken previously to it, to me writing Thanos and stuff, and he kind of knows my like 10 year plan with Thanos that I'm doing at Marvel. And, um, it was in Rose City Comic Con in Portland, and he walked by my table and he said, hey, uh, I'd really like to take you out to coffee uh, this afternoon when you come. And I was like, yes, of course, my lord and savior, Jim Sterling. <laughs> and so we went out and we sat down, and he very, very, very kindly and very earnestly and sincerely, I'm, I'm going to well up, I'm going to cry, I'm gonna, don't tell the story, right? he said that when he took over writing The Hulk, when he was a young man, that Jack Kirby took him out to coffee and gave and gave Jim Starlin the keys to the car and was just like, I'm not the Hulk guy anymore, you're the Hulk guy, and I'm giving you my blessing and, and the Hulk is yours now. And then and then proceeded to tell Jim how to write the Hulk and what the Hulk meant. And he said, and I wanna do that for Thanos with you. Dude. Yeah, so like Jim Sterling like, gave me Thanos, and it was fucking awesome. You got the keys to the helicopter. It was amazing, the, the Thanos <laughs> helicopter, you already know. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a big responsibility, and so, you know. And then Jerry Duggan decided to kill Thanos like a month after that and ruined all my plans, which is fine, which is fine. Um, for anybody who reads my Guardians of the Galaxy run, you know that Thanos' body was halfway resurrected, but then it was blown through a black hole. Well, if you read my Silver Surfer Black series, what do we know about what happens when things go through black holes? Pay attention. Pay attention. I feel like these are hints towards this 10-year plan. Now, the Silver Surfer Black, that, that's perfect segue because I, I was telling you yesterday, I didn't get Silver Surfer. Right. And Silver Surfer is Stan Lee's favorite character, and as a comic fan, I was like, what don't I get? Right. And it drove me insane because I felt like a bad fan until Silver Surfer Black. Well, thank you. And that truly, like, it's a revolutionary book, and the, the art, the whole no, feeling no. of the book, it's an atmosphere. Yeah. How would you interpret Silver Surfer in the films when you can get him? How, what story would you tell so the world can translate? Because it seems too big. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, gosh, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I, I, I completely get where you're coming from with Silver Surfer because he is, he is a bit of a taciturn, quiet, very introspective character. Um, and I, I wrote him as a pacifist for the most part. You know, if you read that book, like, he, he does blow up a dragon in space with a fireball, but that's just fucking cool. Um, but I wanted to write a, so Silver Surfer Black and Thanos Wins are companion pieces to each other. Uh, Thanos Wins is a story about going into the future and facing yourself and facing the end of everything. And Silver Surfer Black is about going into the past and finding your 
yourself and finding hope. And so one's at the beginning of time and one is at the end of time. And Thanos destroys everything and Silver Surfer gives birth to, 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 to everything, right? Um, and so I wanted to write something that was hopeful because so much of what I do is not hopeful. I write, I tend to write stone cold bummers. Um, I don't know though, I, I was very inspired to write that book. It, you, you, know, you know, it's funny, originally it was not called Silver Surfer Black. It was just going to be a Silver Surfer book that Trad Moore and I were going to do together. And then I was at an airport um, and I got news uh, that Stan had passed away. And I had already written the entire first issue, which was completely different than what, what that actually printed. And I just sat down and I just started like crying, like really openly crying in this airport that, that Stan was gone. And I knew that Stan's, like you said, like Stan's favorite creation, he, 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 he always said, was, was, was the Silver Surfer. And so I thought, I have such an enormous responsibility in front of me because I am about to write the first Silver Surfer book to exist on a planet that Stan doesn't exist on. And so I erased the entire thing that I had written and I renamed it Black because I was in mourning. And um, I, I tried to write something that I thought would be big enough and loud enough and beautiful enough to where he would see it from wherever he is and be proud of us. You did, man. So. It, if you guys ever read that book, it is one of the books of the decade. It's, it's well, thank perfect. You. Thank you. Uh, on the other side of Silver Surfer, a character that should never work. Cosmic Ghost Rider. Oh, it's the stupidest. Like, piece of this character. <laughs> Cosmic Frank Castle. With, like, go, how did that idea, what series of, of events led to that amalgamation? Um, as a character that I've wanted to do since, like, 2007. Like, like, like literally, like, back when I was like, a, a retailer, and I wasn't even a writer of comics or anything. Uh, people always ask, like, oh, where did it come from? And I think they expect a deeper answer than what my answer is. I thought that I was like, oh, the Ghost Rider, that would look dope in space. <laughs> I mean, I was like, that would look awesome and airbrushed on a van. <laughs> and he does. Um, and then I just knew that like, a, cost, like, a, a Ghost Rider in space would, would visually look cool. Um, I'm actually kind of lying a little bit because my, my, uh, my tattoo artist, uh, Ian, who does my, my sleeve, I was going through a book of uh, Flash, as no flashes in the comic book world, and books that you can like choose pieces. And he had this drawing of a skeleton in space with a helmet on, riding a bike with a with the front wheel was a big ball of energy. And I was like, yo, what is that? And he was like, I don't know. And I was like, I'm gonna take it and make so much money off your idea. Um, and, and, and I have. Uh, no, and so I just, I just thought that that design, it was really more the bike than anything else. I was like, dude, Ghost Rider in space, that'd be awesome. And then I started thinking about it, and again, you guys have to keep in mind, I was not writing comics at this point in my life. I was a retailer, so I, I had, there was no reason for me to be coming up with ideas for anything, right? Um, and then just like talking with my buddies and stuff, I was like, well, who should it be? And I was always, I was always very much in love with Marvel comics and DC comics that would, introduce a new character and you wouldn't know who they were. It's like this big mystery. You know, who is this guy, right? And I was like, I wanted to do that. And I was like, well, who likes vengeance more than Frank Castle? Right? <laughs> and to me, it just, it just makes so much sense. You know? Um, and then I started, they gave me the job of Thanos and I needed someone to come back in time. I needed some character to go get Thanos and bring him to King Thanos. And I was like, well, it shouldn't be a, like anyone in, 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 in like the Black Order. It shouldn't be because these are people who are directly tied to Thanos. And so I was like, well, fuck, who am I going to use? I was like, oh my god, that stupid character that I can use. And so I put him in there and I based his speech pattern off of Bill Burr, the comedian, <laughs> for no other reason than I thought it would be funny. You know, like I, it, it, it's more apparent. It, I, I lessened it as he's. He's only really crazy when he's flamed on. When he's not, I tend to write him a little bit more like Frank, you know? But like when he first meets Thanos, and Thanos like starts to like lord over him, like, like cosmic go go uh, ghost writers like, rrr, rrr, rrr. you just take a couple little steps back, right? Take a couple steps back. Like that's just Bill Burr, you know? I now uh, need a what if cartoon voiced by Bill Burr. Yeah, the cosmic Burr. ghost writer. And, and so I had his entire origin like planned out, and I was like, I'm gonna do his origin in issue three. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, the thing is though, like everyone was 
shocked online that it was Frank Castle. And like, no one on Twitter got it right. People were asking stuff, all the, everyone thought it was Deadpool, obviously. Um, but by the, in his first appearance, he shows up with a giant skull on his chest. And I was like, is really no one paying attention, you know? Um, and the only reason he, his first design, he didn't have chains. But then I was like, no, 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 we're making the most 90s stupid character of all time. He needs red spikes and glowing chains. Um, and man, it's so weird that you guys like him so much. Because I thought he was going to, I mean, here's how much I didn't believe in him. I killed him, like, three issues later. And then they were like, hey, he has an ongoing solo title that you're going to write. And I'm like, fuck, I'm not going to get him out of there. I was like, Valhalla? That sounds cool. So, I mean, the book itself, Cosmic Ghost Rider, uh, is, just, is just so much the book that should not be. Um, you guys want to hear what the original pitch for it was? Yes. So it's one of the only times I've ever been told no at Marvel. So, same exact premise where he's in Valhalla, and then he is just an asshole, and Odin's like, you gotta go. Um, and Odin's like, I, I'll send you anywhere where you want to go. Same thing, he goes to Titan a million years ago, and he's like, not only am I going to kill Thanos, th th this is the original pitch now. He's like, not only am I going to kill Thanos, but like, nothing good ever comes from Titan. So like, I'm just going to blow up this whole planet, like, screw Titan. And so that big ball of energy on his bike is like an atom bomb, and so he just like releases it, and he like drives through Titan and destroys it. So Titan is breaking apart, right? It's like coming apart. And baby Thanos' parents, canonically, are scientists. So they put him in a rocket. <laughs> and they launch him to save him. And he lands in, uh, in, a, in a cornfield and is raised by a Titan couple. And my editor, Jordan, was like, well, that's hilarious. was like, thank you, correct, that is hilarious. And he was like, but is that a story about Cosmic Ghost Rider? And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> I don't know what that story's about. Uh, but I ended up, so it was going to be Frank Castle finding him and then raising him. So I was going to get Punisher Thanos no matter what. But I think, I think what we figured out was better. But I just, I fucking love that joke. <laughs> I can hear the lawyers right now from here. You know, oh, I get in trouble so much. I, I just destroyed the entire DC universe in Thor. Yeah. And I think when people were so mad at me, like, it's so disrespectful, and I'm like, point of order, they're drawings on pieces of paper, relax. <laughs> and I was sitting next to Jim Lee, they were doing a sign, and Jim was just like, why is everyone mad at you on Twitter? And I was like, oh, do you not know? And, I, and he was like, no, what? I was like, I just, I destroyed your company. And he was like, what? And I showed it to him, and he goes, oh, that's hilarious, that's great. In the opening of the book, just slide it over. pages, I killed him. Now, when someone takes a character that you invented yourself that completely came from your mind, like a Paul Shear on that run, sure. uh, yeah. like the Tom Doc Paul Shear run's also hilarious. Yeah, sure. What's it like reading someone else with your name? I don't read it. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no I, 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 I read it in script form, but, 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 but you know, I really don't, I really don't get that hands-on about it. You know, I've worked on some characters in the past where the original creator of those characters is really hands-on and has a lot of opinions about like what you're supposed to do and like how you're supposed to write them and stuff. And I just, I'm just, I, just, I, I, you know, these characters don't belong to me. They belong to you guys, you know. And so like a character like Cosmic Ghost Rider or, or like, you know, even like what I'm doing with Venom. Like when I'm done with Venom, it is not my book anymore. And like whoever comes up after me, if they come in and they go and and. and first page and he wakes up from a dream and goes like, oh, that was weird anyway. Like, I don't give a shit. Like, I, like, that, that, kind of, that kind of stuff doesn't bother me at all because Lord knows I have come in on people's books and just burned it all to the ground. That's my job, you know? I mean, I'm the guy who wrote Death the Inhumans. I can't be mad about anything. No. I was like, I went into the room and I was just like, I don't think I've ever really enjoyed an Inhumans book. This is, this is my pitch for Inhumans. I was like, I find the Inhumans to be really inaccessible, and for a Western audience, they're very, uh, like, uh, royal, and they're boring, and uh, the only two characters that anyone gives a shit about don't talk, and one's a dog, and the other dude's a mute, so that no one talks, and I was like, in my pitches, I want to do John Wick in space, so I want to kill that dog, and then I want everyone, literally every other character who's an inhuman to die, 
and Charles Soule was in the room and he was like, you know I wrote in humans for a long time, right? Like, I'm here, I, I can hear you. And I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. And he was just like, are you gonna kill all the inhumans that I created? And I was like, what did I just say? It's like, I, <laughs> you said you could hear me. I just said this. And then I was telling this story to Ryan Stegman just as a joke, and me and Charles were home, so it's a dull joke. I was telling that, and, and Ryan goes, yeah, you know, I drew that book. He's like, I co-own all of those characters. And I was like, well, screw you too. I don't know what to tell you. That. And, Shit happens, you know. Fuck goes for you guys. I got, for goes for I got in trouble one time because they were like, I wanted to dig up Flash Thompson's body. I wanted to like exhume his grave. And they were like, that's really disrespectful. And I was like, well, Dan Slott blew his legs off and then killed him. How am I the answer? Like, they were like, that's really disrespectful to like, like, like Ditko and like Lee who created that character. And I'm like, you guys sent him to my rack and blew his legs off. The jerk. Flash hasn't had a good run in a long time. Flash is better dead. So this is a current book, so light spoilers. I'll try to keep the issues one and two, but I gotta ask, because this Thor run is out of its mind. Yeah. Thank you. And the moment the first issue ends, you know it's not like any other Thor you've ever read. So first issue spoilers. He's a herald? What was that idea? Where did that come from? That is huge. Uh, well, it, it, was a, it was a lot of different things. One was... Um, uh, I, I had had, I have, I had like three different arcs that I might want to use as my opening uh, for Thor. Because I have a really huge, crazy, stupid, long plan for Thor, obviously. And I had a few different ones that I wanted to use. And actually, the one that I'm, the, my second arc that I'm doing with Thor, I think actually would have probably been a better first arc because it's, uh, it's way different than like what Jason was doing. But, uh, it's a little bit quieter, it's a little bit scarier, and I'm following Jason Aaron on Thor. It's the scariest job in comics. Seven right? years of Jason Aaron. Well, no, no, not, not only that, Jason Aaron has written more issues of Thor than any other human being on Earth. Yeah. And so that's why my Thor run is about Thor being like, am I, do I have any cool stories left? Like, my Thor literally is a guy who's, who thinks, are all my best days behind me? Am I retired now? And so it's 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 uh, it's Thor living in his father's shadow as much as I'm 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 in Jason's right. And so a part of that was very carefully constructed in a way that I knew that as long as I was writing, no matter what story I was telling, if he still had one arm and one eye and still looked and in the big in the beard and everything, I was telling stories with Jason's. Story. And so I was like, I'm gonna do my Galactus thing first and foremost because it opens very respectfully about Jason's run and about Galactus or, or, or about Asgard and stuff. And then Galactus falling on top of Asgard is kind of me being like, "Hi, I'm Donny Cates. I'll be taking care of your Thor from now on." And I, like, literally a a me story falls on top of a Jason story, <laughs> and then turning him into a herald just visually gets him out of Asgard and gets him kind of, not like back to status quo, but I get to make what Donny Cates' Thor looks like. I thought that was really important to establish right up top. It's like Tom Hardy with the knee brace in Mad Max. Like you're, you're acknowledging the past all the Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, and that's the thing is that like, I'm not, I'm not, and you, as the Thor run goes, um, as my, especially this, this, this first arc, I'm gonna be talking a lot more t to Jason's run. Because, you know, in Jason's run, we saw the future. And in the future, he has one arm and he has one eye and everything like that. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that. We're, we're gonna talk about how, like, something has happened that has changed the natural order of things. That that was supposed to be his destiny, his fate, and something has broken that. And so we're gonna start talking about that. There's a reason the hammer is getting heavier. There's a reason that things are going wrong. Uh, something is broken in Asgard, and we're going to get we're going to get, get to the bottom. Of it. So changing the status quo is one of the more consistent things in all your runs. You take these beloved characters, put your stamp on it, reinvent them in a really specific way every time. Is there a character you can legally say you haven't gotten to do that with yet that you <laughs> want to uh, at Marvel or DC? Um, I don't know the other company. 
you talking about? Are they? <laughs> they're they're a distinguished competition of some kind. Um, well, I mean, the three biggest publishing houses in in, in comics is Marvel, DC, and Batman. Uh, and so, when Marvel Image, and Batman. <laughs> I, I would like to eventually write Batman, of course, uh, but I'm nowhere near done in Marvel. Um, I have a pitch for uh, the Hulk that I hope to get to do someday. Uh, that is maybe the craziest shit I've ever thought of in my life. And uh, it's already been approved. It's just a matter of when I'll have time to do it. And uh, I, I, I don't want to live in a world in which Al Ewing's not writing a mortal hole. So as long as that dude wants to do that, God bless. Uh, but I am not going to leave this earth until I write Amazing Spider-Man. Yes. Uh, it is my best friend. It has been my life. It's my it's my dream in life is 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 to get to Peter and bring him. <laughs> it won't go well for him, I can tell. It's not gonna be great at all for Peter. That's one of the Dan Slott told me that he was like the worst thing about being the writer of Amazing Spider-Man is that you have to be mean to Peter Parker. <laughs> like, and it makes me like there were scenes in Absolute Carnage like when he webs his hands up and has to like break a wall down. I was like, I'm sorry, dog, but like, this is how we, this is what we gotta do, man. This is what we're doing at work today. I'm sorry, you know. It's much more '90s trying to be a junior than Mike Ringo. It's like a very yeah, yeah, broken yeah. man. Yeah. Uh, now the advocates are this incredible community, and like your interaction with them on Twitter and everything has been so cool. What is it like to kind of shepherd such a positive fandom of comics, which is fairly toxic in general? You've got a really cool corner of the internet. Yeah, my cult is a nice cult. Positive cult. Positive cult. Um, so those of you who don't know, I, I have a, I don't know, like a fan club, I guess you'd call it. They're, they're called the Devil's Advocates, my last name. Um, and they're awesome. They're like a bunch of really sweet dudes. If you're, ever at a, if you're ever at a con and you see someone wearing that shirt right there, that is a person who will help you. If, if somebody is... If there is somebody who's, if you're a, if you're a lady, you're being harassed, or someone's being inappropriate, or something like that, you can talk to one of the advocates. They will they will get you safe or get you something to eat or whatever the hell. And it it, and it just is that. It's just I, it's so much of Twitter is toxic. So much of that kind of stuff is so hateful, and I get a lot of it. Um, that I wanted to let people know that like there's really good people out there, and like you know. Uh, there's a lot of positivity. We have tenants. Our 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 uh, our slogan that is on all of our shirts and stuff is read comics, do dope shit. Just be nice to people. Just be nice. You know, read comics, be cool. Um, we have merch and stuff like that. Uh, you can go to um, baby. What's our the website? What? Advocatescult.com. Um, and you get my merch and stuff like that. We have shirts, we have hats. Uh, we're doing a, we're, we're, we're doing a new one, we're doing a new shirt. It's on like a, like a men, metal band like logo. It has sleeves that say "Be Dope" for comics on it. It's awesome. So the advocates is a cool thing. It costs you nothing, and you get a, mem a, a little mem membership card with every purchase. Um, that will get you like um, exclu ex ex exclusive variants and stuff in the future. Uh, but it's just like a really positive group. So if you're interested in that, I sell them at my table. So we're gonna do five minutes of fan questions. So if a few of you guys want to line up by all means, but I have one last question because from Thanos to Venom to Thor to everything, have you found those Venom shoes yet? Because that's been a lot of news this week. No, dude. <laughs> those Venom shoes are impossible. Does anybody know what I'm talking about right now? <laughs> The Venom shoes. There's articles about your hunt. It's amazing. Bleeding Cool will write an article about me getting a cold. I, I, I don't under... It. Journalism. Jew Terror is maybe the worst human being ever on the earth. I hope you guys report that. Um, I genuinely, like, I wish misfortune upon him. Uh, he, uh... I probably shouldn't say that. He's got That's, the bell on fire. I know, I know. No, he's just a jerk, and he, like, my name gets clicked, so he, like, writes everything. But I... There's Reebok in 2012 had this partnership with Marvel and they made these Venom shoes and they're so dope. And you just can't find them online. They're, they're, just, they're, they're, they're just gone. They're like super rare. Uh, I even had CB Zabolski reach out to Reebok themselves and nothing. So 
It'll be someday I will find them. Some fan will come and bring them to me, and that person. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna give them anything. <laughs> but, I'll be Very but I'll be like super happy about it. <laughs> uh, so last question for me. I have always wondered if there was a moment that you realized when you were reading and doing retail that you wanted to write a certain character. When it switched over, your brain went from business. From pleasure to business, was there like a, oh, I'm a comic writer? Or has it still been like, I wake up and go, oh, I'm a comic writer? Yeah, it's still kind of real weird. Um, I, was, uh, I was a retailer for a really long time. I really, I, I loved it. I, I, I wanted to do that. Like, I, I really, that was my goal. I wanted to be a retailer for a long time. And then um, a guy was trying to teach his girlfriend how to drive in the parking lot. And she put it in drive instead of reverse, and she drove into my store. Ah. So I suppose that was the moment <laughs> when God was like, mm -mm, no, get out of there. And then I went to school to learn how to be a penciler, because I'm a decent artist, but really slow. And so I went to SCAD to be a penciler, and I found myself in classes with Jeff Shaw and Trad Moore. And so I was like, well, never mind, because uh, I'll never be that good. And so I just used my scholarship, which I, which I got my scholarship, no lie, with sculptures of Venom. It's absolutely true. Like Venom, like Venom saved my life. Like Venom got me here. Um, and so I, I got this scholarship, and so I ended up just um, using my scholarship to not buy books or anything. And I would just, I gave it, I gave money to Trad and Jeff to start drawing books for me. <laughs> and so it worked out. Fantastic way to get the scholarship. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, read comics and do dope shit. Thank all you right. all very much. Don is going to be at his booth hanging out. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it, y'all. Thanks, guys.